Welcome to today's podcast interview. I have brought on Nat Nat. Nat Nat, welcome. Thank you, Heather. I'm looking forward to this playful and a deep dive of a conversation. Uh, me too. Um, please give listeners a little background. Where do you live and what do you do? I live in Ottawa, Canada. So that is about four hours from Toronto because that's what people recognize uh, Canada for. Yet I actually live in the capital of Canada. So this is where the prime minister lives. Uh, I have a company called Lift Oneself, which I founded in 2019. And that provides energy healing. And what that means in energy healing is being able to engage with your nervous system and release emotional blockages that you have suppressed down into your body. And people will be like, huh? And it's like, well, a lot of times where you're feeling stuck or you're feeling uncomfortable or all these different things, it's because there's authentic emotions that you need to feel that you've never been given a space to actually feel those things. And the reason why I founded that company is because I almost died 10 years ago. In 2014, I was hospitalized with lesions in my brainstem and in my cerebellum. I was told I was going to die and I was in there for almost like 40 days. And anybody that knows if they keep you in the hospital and you have something they don't really understand, you go through a lot of painful tests. So I had lumbar punctures and spinal tap, like spinal taps as people know it, um, biopsies and even radiation put into me. And so I got a really good seat uh, in view of the nervous system and really understanding how belief systems are created, how our chemical dumps, because I could feel in real time when adrenaline would be dumping or when I would get some endorphins or cortisol, I could actually feel the drops going through the whole system. And so by doing that, I got to create a language that was simple for people. And to be able for them to relate with their own biology. Uh, and the help that I really got was learning meditation in 2015, a year after I was diagnosed. Well, I wasn't given a diagnosis for the lesions. Um, so that left me in the wilderness to try and figure out how do I get back my health and be a parent? Because my twins were four years old at the time, twin boys, and I was a solo parent. So the meditation allowed me to really start dropping into my body and allowing those somatic releases to happen in the nervous system and in my body and allow me to go beyond my defense mechanisms and go into that vulnerability, that self, that oneness, the void or, you know, God or the abyss, whatever language people speak about that place where we're all connected. Um, and when I say all, that means the planets, the universe, nature, trees, all of it is all connected in that energy. There is so much I want to deep dive and it's like, I wish I could have you for weeks, but here's, I want to start at a very high level so people understand. We have been conditioned and pushed into suppressing our emotions. I have so much compassion and empathy for men because I feel men especially are taught at a very young age, don't cry, that it's weak, it's vulnerable. Men in you know, military were taught, you can't have emotions. So there's this deep conditioning that it wasn't okay to feel them. And I, I love the saying, you have to feel it to heal it. But let's start at high level and talk about if you have been stuck suppressing emotions, anger, resentment, guilt, shame, what, what is happening physiologically and also mentally? Well, physiologically, you're running your system very rampant because the nervous system is pushing down these emotions and emotions are energy. So there's becoming a conflict in your system. So then that impacts your neural energy. So usually at times it will ignite, it will ignite your fight or flight, yet it will be either you'll be in a lot of adrenaline trying to run away from this stuff and you're taking action and keeping busy, or you'll be very lethargic and just frozen and bed rot and stuck because you don't know how to release its energy and their messages. Our emotions are messengers. They're here to give us some information. They're not telling you to take direction with them though. The reason why we usually take direction is because we want to project it off. 
because we haven't been given the tools to ride the waves of the discomfort that goes on in the body when these emotions traverse through our system. Right. And that leads us to living in very high stress, survival states, numbing out. And so we're so disconnected from our body, creating total chaos in our life. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And not even being alive, not being fully present in your own life to right. really tap in to see how am I feeling? How am I connecting with these people? Am I actually here or is there a numbness to me and I'm just doing what is required. Am I actually feeling the connections and conversations and the experience with somebody or wherever you are? Well, and I want to hear from you, but I feel like the masses are living in this state. The masses are kind of walking around like zombies living in autopilot stuck dwelling on the past so we're lacking presence we're lacking inspiration so can we talk about some of the symptoms people may be facing mentally emotionally physically that we can help them to now course correct to get in tune with their nervous system to create a better future would you be willing to do a short guided meditation with me so i can bring people into a moment to really be uh, aware of their nervous system Let's go. Okay. And for the listeners, a lot of times you're listening to this podcast while driving. So when I ask Heather and myself to close their eyes, please don't do that. I want you to be safe and everybody around you. Yet the other prompts you're able to follow. Another safety is if you're getting too relaxed for whatever activity requires your focus, please stop and just go to our conversation. And when you have a moment to really do this meditation, which I call a mindful moment, come back to it and you'll see what the benefit is to uh, this mindful moment, this meditation. So Heather, I'll ask you to get comfortable in your seat and you're going to gently close your eyes. And you're going to begin breathing in and out through your nose. And you're going to bring your awareness to watching your breath go in and out through your nose. You're not going to try and control your breath. You're just going to be aware of the breath going in your nostrils, down into your lungs, and watching it go back out. By now, you're going to see the rhythm of your breath which will bring some sensations or feelings in your body. Let them come up. You're safe to feel. You're safe to let go. Surrender the need to control. Release the need to resist and just be. Be with your breath. Drop into your body. keeping your awareness on your breath. There may be some thoughts or memories that are popping up. It's okay. Gently bring your awareness back to your breath. Give yourself space between your thoughts and your breath. See that your thoughts aren't you. still allowing those sensations and feelings to pass through you while staying with your breath and dropping deeper into your body. Continue keeping your awareness on your breath. Still keeping your awareness on your breath at your own time and at your own pace. You're going to gently open your eyes while still staying with your breath. How do you feel in your body? I don't hear you. Sorry. Uh, I said I'm very relaxed. Like, 
but I I've done a lot of meditation. And so it's dropping into that theta and it's like, I could have taken a nap, but yes. And even that, the power of that, that pausing, um, I mean, I could feel tension in my jaw. And so it was just releasing that and yeah, very calm. Yeah. So there's something with the frequency of my voice and the work I've done with my nervous system that brings that relaxation that people feel safe to come into their body and to just off of that treadmill of thoughts and recognize, oh, there's another dimension I can go into that I wasn't aware of. And so by taking these mindful moments, you get to tap in to see where is the tension? Where is the knots? What am I actually feeling? Where a lot of us were not taught to do this. We were taught to not be certain things, not feel certain things. We weren't validated to be able to feel them, release them, and navigate through them. So yeah, you have a whole society that look like zombies and robots because they've never been given any kind of emotional intelligence. They've always just been told what not to be, what not to do. So if I start feeling this, there's something wrong with me because people have told me not to feel these things. You know, what's coming to mind, this is a huge lifestyle shift because think about, especially in the Western world, we have glorified and it's a badge of honor to hustle and grind and work 36 hours a day. And, and we're living in high stress, unfulfillment, uh, dysregulated nervous system. So for those individuals who are like, yep, I'm there or I've been there and I'm coming out of it. Where do we begin to start creating this presence and intentionality and feeling connecting to our body? So this mindful moment that I just did, it was like a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, I would say max. And if you could start doing that every hour and people will say, I don't have time for that. You actually do. Yeah. Like when you go to the bathroom, it takes a little bit of time to, you're able to just give yourself that break so that you can start breaking the pattern and start being responsible and accountable for your inner state by supplying your needs to treat yourself as a human being, not as a robot, not as a product that the system wants you to do and run and be. So by doing these, these, you know, if you can get a meditation practice of longer, then that really helps you really, you know, regulate and be in that void, um, the abyss, the one oneness, it's like you, you get to start to see there's something beyond what these thoughts keep, you know, repeating and looping me into. Cause what you got to realize is the nervous system has one function. Don't die. Yeah. And it's based on negative biases. So when people are like, I worry so much and I'm, I, and, and I got all these problems and I'm the should haves and the what ifs and the, and I'm like, well, yeah, you're dysregulated. Your nervous system's trying to find safety. So it's looking at all the possible scenarios that would be unsafe. You haven't told it to look at all the possibilities that would be safe. And that's our job to be able to surrender of not only taking from our past experiences, which the nervous system does, and it takes from memories that you may have seen too, like whatever movies you may have seen, it's recording that also. So it's like, oh, we saw somebody go through that. That could happen to us too. Yeah. It's not, and it's not, unless you start training it, it's not going to see those possibilities. It's only going to see the problems. So the work is, okay, your, your, your problems, you're finding all the problems. Let's find the solutions now. So those that are trying to be there for themselves, you know, start to find out what is it that you need? I know that's a foreign concept when people hear, what do you mean? What do I need? I, I don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, well, you have needs to be able to regulate and soothe your nervous system. I understand the spiritual practice. If you can have no wants and no needs, yeah, that takes a long journey to get there. Yeah. So in the meantime, 
what would help you to not disassociate and jump out of your body all the time because it's too overwhelming? What is it that will help you to come back home and stay home in your body when everything feels like a shit show inside? And start to honor what you're actually feeling. And don't do it alone. Find somebody. Find somebody that that is going to hold the sacred space for you and they are not going to try to interrupt your pain. It is very challenging to witness pain in others without trying to interfere. So when people see people crying or getting angry, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we got to change the state. We got to change it rather than, oh, what what are you feeling? What what? And I, I get anger is um is a very powerful emotion and it usually hijacks our behavior and, and there's violent actions that are taken. Yeah, when you understand it a little bit more, you can redirect it in a way that it can have expression. And it's not in a way that's destructive, that it can take expression by, oh, let's bang something here or bang something there just to get it out, rather than you go break something or go bang somebody. It's working with yourself, not against yourself, and not having this all or nothing utopia perfection area. It's like you still got to navigate through real life of responsibilities, of bills, of family, of jobs, all these different things. Yet it's like, okay, how do I come back into my body so that I can break these habits for myself and I can start trusting myself because the world separates you from trusting yourself. Here's a question I have for you and, and something I wrote down. This takes a lot of self-awareness. And if we're habitually living in suppressing and running and escaping our emotions, I remember a client years ago when I got him into this idea of meditation, maybe in the morning, first thing before your day gets off or in the evening before bed, because he had some trouble sleeping to sit and like just stillness and he said he literally felt like he was crawling out of his skin he was so uncomfortable so he he quit on himself and people are going to do that so how can we guide them and help them okay like that discomfort is oh dispensa calls it sitting through the fire of discomfort i remember for, i'll speak from my personal experience i i've been to many of his events his week-long and advanced follow-ups and I remember one of the guide for meditations, I am sitting there and I've been meditating for years and I'm sitting there. I'm frustrated. I'm feeling impatient. I'm because my mind's wandering and like I, I'm not relaxing. And, and so that that monkey mind was taking over. And so after that session, I went to one of the meditation assists and I shared with her what happened. And so she had me name the emotions frustration, impatience, discomfort, whatever. And she's like, you know, is um, are you familiar with those emotions? Yes. And so again, it was sitting through the fire of discomfort because when you sit through it, then they're able to like, I don't, I don't know if dissolve is the word, but um, what am I trying to say when we can sit through it? That's actually the freedom process. Thank You're you. processing them to pass through. Yeah. So for somebody who's new to this and uncomfortable, how, how can you guide them to like, that's the work, that's what you have to do to free and liberate yourself. I want to give a heavy warning about this. Some people have been harmed in their body. So coming back into that um, is very threatening. And then there's a visceral charge that comes out. And so that can really impact somebody's mental state if they don't have the proper tools. So anybody listening to this, and if you really feel this visceral threat that comes into your body, I would ask you, rather than sit with a meditation, find some music and dance mm -hmm. and allow it to have some somatic releases so that you can still stay with the feeling yet engage with it in a way that it can be processed out of your body so that those big chargers are gone so that you can come back into the city. Because to tell some people, oh, well, just sit through it, it, it can really um, distort their mental state because there's so much coming through and they don't have the proper tools to navigate through all of that. 
So I just want to give that warning because it's a valid thing. And we have been conditioned to be very busy with things. Mm -hmm. Another thing that can help with that meditation is humming. Humming helps with our vagus nerve and it down regulates. So it brings down the anxiety. I don't know if anybody ever recognizes that um, with slavery, you'd always hear people humming or people in prison systems, they're always singing while they're doing their activities because the singing and humming vibrates because our vagus nerve starts at the top of the back of our throat and that's the down regulation. So to bring down anxiety. So humming, when I have new clients, like I have in-person events, what I have them do for, because some have never meditated before, is doing six minutes of humming to help to train the body that we're going to go into a state that feels safe and that it's okay so that there's preparation. Yet it's always recognizing that if you can sit with it a second more than what you did, you're doing the progress. You're doing the progress. It's I understand that you want to just push eject and run away. I, I hey, listen, when I learned meditation and all that stuff was coming up, my meditation teacher told me, she's like, usually people at a certain level, they quit meditation because they're getting deeper and deeper. And the reason why they quit is because all the things you suppress are now finally coming up. And it's like, it doesn't feel good in the body. Like you said, why have I been meditating for so long? And why with this anger and, and frustration? Because you've reached another level of your body to release things that have been stored. And it doesn't mean it had to be way back in your childhood. It could have been just the week prior that you didn't have time to process what was going on. And so it's recognizing like a human state, there's no arrival with this. Yet it's always having kindness and better understanding of what was actually accomplished. And what can we get back to? One second makes a world of difference in meditation. People want minutes and hours. One second with sitting with that changes the narrative for your nervous system of, oh, it's safe. We, we can feel this. Yeah, a little bit more next time, a little bit more next time. Other people, they can go full throttle and sit with it because they have the mindset that I'm going to engage with this no matter what. Other people aren't built like that. So it's meeting people exactly where they are and using the encouragement of, you know, let's see where your progress is. And, and then whatever the feelings were, like you went to your meditation teacher, what were you actually feeling? What were the things that were coming up that you don't feel you're, you have safety to feel those things? Here's what I want to ask you. When we get into a space, there's so many tools and so many modalities, some that I'm aware of, like Wim Hof is really big on cold plunges to regulate your nervous system. Obviously, yeah. breath work is a big one. Sitting in meditation. I have felt the release in, when I'm running. For me, that's a moving meditation. And so I want to offer individuals, find a modality that works for you and test a lot of them. But I just named a few. Now let's talk about on the other side, when we have these tools in our tool belt and we're able to self-regulate, living proactive rather than reactive and that healthy nervous system, what's possible on the other side? What's possible is joy. Yeah. A lot of people don't even know how to have joy in their life. They have to have a reason for joy. There's play. You know how many people don't even know how to play? Because they have to have a reason to have play. There is abundance. There is a way to relate with yourself that even though your environment may not have changed, the way you show up in it is totally different. There's an ease. There's a curiosity. There's excitement. There's peace. There's, you know, endurance. There's tenacity. There's resilience. There's so much possibilities of your growth and your potential that you've never been able to support because you've only stayed at one level. You didn't know that your potential could grow in other ways. Because nobody's ever encouraged you to see the little small steps help with the growth, not these big, you know, life changing um, experiences. Those don't really last. It's the small steps. 
yeah, relating with yourself and not feeling that frustration and berating, that's a liberation. So let's talk about when it comes to, quote, manifesting. We all have goals, desires, wishes, dreams in this human experience. But what I've learned through manifest manifestation and, and all the manifesting teachers, the thing you are seeking is actually the emotion or feeling it will give you. So people think they want to win millions where all they really want is to feel free. People think they want to be in a relationship to feel love, but really like you have to have self-love first. So I guess what I'm seeing is it's literally going from survival mode, fear, lack, scarcity, stress, worry into joy, ease, abundance. And this is our actual natural state, right? Mm -hmm. It is. So we're stuck in these altered emotions, but they've become habitual. And so can, let's talk about some common problems people face in life where they feel stuck financially, health, relationships, career, the big ones. What is the emotional piece keeping them stuck? They haven't been able to be in their worth and relate to themselves and see that they have worth. You see, a lot of people want to have value, but that's what other people place on you. Your worth is who you are. Yet we have been conditioned that our actions and our doing is what bring worth rather than our being. So many of us don't even know how just to be. And our existence is our being. A lot of emotions that we're, we're trying to soothe is because we've been conditioned that we're not able to regulate those emotions. They have to come from the external of us. So the love piece, people don't realize that when I'm trying to find a partner, what I'm actually asking you is to soothe the wounds that I have within me. Can you make me feel better rather than me taking the responsibility of that on my own? When they're looking for finances, finances is our biggest threat of survival. It's a currency. Yes, I understand it's a currency. It's an energy. It also is a real life thing that if you don't have money, you don't have a home, you don't have food. And these are your basic needs that you need to be able to, you know, walk this earth. So to have a different relationship with currency means to have a different relationship with yourself. And that means facing the fear, facing the lack facing the conditions and the belief systems that were created in your mind so that you can dissolve them and walk through them. Yet it means you're going to have to engage with some shit. I call it processing the shit. Yeah. Every, every garden needs manure. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. Um, yet if you want a good vibrant garden you need manure and everybody has shit to process so just because you know a lot of people think oh well, i got rid of all my childhood trauma i'm like to be human is traumatic so there's people that are going to die there's things that are going to be disrupted the weather patterns are going to do something the governments are going to do something there's always impermanence in this world so you better have to understand your nervous system so that when it gets dysregulated you can bring that bad boy back into regulation you can talk yourself off the ledge. So when you're seeking on the outside, I would ask the question, did you go in first to ask yourself the question, what am I feeling? What am I seeking? What am I needing? And if you start they, 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 they will, they will, that is your indication that you're on the outside of you and you're not going within. You know what I'm really seeing with a lot of this too? It is that mindset shift. It's that new internal narrative. It's like becoming conscious of the unconscious. So I'd love to hear from you. You know, what are some of your daily rituals or practices to keep you present and regulated and processing? Well, the Wim Hof, the cold, like I live in the cold in the winter months. So uh, to re regulate my nervous system, I was walking in the snow bare feet and going in minus 40 temperature and doing the cold plunges, which I still do because there is significant benefit for your nervous system with the chemical releases that happen. And it also teaches your nervous system that the unknown and uncertainty, you can go beyond what the mind thinks is the threshold that you can still keep, you know, stretching that. 
Um, the practices that I use is journaling. Uh, and journaling isn't only in writing. Sometimes journaling is in coloring because the certain feelings or things that I'm going through, I can't, I'm not able to articulate in words. I can only draw it out or color it out so it could have expression. Dancing is a huge one. Being in the nature, um, doing my forest baths and going by the water also is a significant one. Uh, and also meditating. Like I'm an avid meditator. Uh, like when I learned the meditation, what they teach you is to create a quiet room and so that you can meditate. And I'm like, I have twin boys that are five years old. That's not going to work. So I brought meditation to the living room while they were fighting, listening to TV going on. And I saw my nervous system always wanting to interrupt or change things to find like the regulation where it was like, no, come back, come back to the breath. That's okay. That's you don't have to do anything about that. You don't have to do. So allowing those startledness or those things that you feel that you need to interfere because that parenting role, that is a whole other discussion, but that is a seducing role that has you thinking you have to inter interfere in a lot of things, which it isn't your place because your children have their own, you know, pain that they have to go through and ways to navigate in the world to better understand it. So, you know, journaling, dancing, moving my body, going in nature, doing the cold blend, cold plunges, doing the breathing um, exercises. Uh, and, you know, my meditation, like when you just saw me going into my breath is what I do is my vipassana of, okay, let me start releasing whatever has been stored in my body and, and regulate. So I'm constantly doing that all the time. I do my sitting practice also, yet I'm always, you know, checking in every so often, like I've checked in many times in this conversation, what am I actually feeling? Like, what what is being said? How am I feeling? What am I processing? I want to go back to real quick, two words you said, because I, I haven't really discussed this before in a podcast, but it's important. So the two words are unknown and uncertainty. And I think that's everything we avoid and run from, but that's actually, so in, in my understanding, let me talk about my understanding and my perception. As Dr. Joe Dispenza would teach, when we close our eyes, when we have sensory deprivation and we can go within and he, he you know, he teaches us, um, to focus our energy inward and then to focus it expands to the quote void, to the oneness, to the quote unknown, because in the unknown is where all the knowns, that's how we bring it to fruition. So how, how can we change our mindset perspective to actually embrace the unknown, to have excited anticipation for uncertainty, to live in this like idea of letting the universe surprise me and I don't have to control everything. Um, did you, do you recognize that you're always in the unknown and uncertainty? No. That's your first step. Our mind in the world has conditioned us to not that we have control over things. Right. Yeah, right now it's unknown and uncertainty. We've just, you know, it can be very overwhelming for the nervous system if we haven't learned to regulate and be comfortable with the unknown and uncertainty. Because in the unknown and uncertainty, your nervous system is trying to find what are the possible things that would kill us. Right. And so having a different relationship with death really helps that. And that's what helped me because I had the lesions in my brain and my cerebellum. So I had, a, uh, I went through um, death and had a, a, a totally different relationship and saw how we're always trying to control to avoid the unknown and uncertainty yet we're always in it we just we're in this kind of bubble in our mind that makes us feel protected and and gives us a uh, an illusion that we're not in that yeah. but we are actually always in it so what's that mindset shift or that perspective shift, the the false narrative, the illusion that we have control when the truth is we don't? How do you, what's the shift? Safety in your body. Okay. To tell your nervous system you're safe to 
and you have the capacity to go through whatever experience you're going to go through. Mm. It's taken me a long time to be in this space. Like right now I'm going through another life challenge and my nervous system is very dysregulated and my mind wants to just quit and this. And I'm like, what are the tools to help me navigate? I'm priming my mind to find the things that are possible rather than look at the lack and shut it down because it's very painful emotionally right now, what I'm going through. So I'm having to tell myself, okay, what is the pain I'm avoiding? Because we here in the Western, especially pain, people are taking a pill for everything or trying to avoid any kind of pain where, you know, pain is healthy. There's a, a part of pain that you're going to need for life. Yet what we've created is a lot of suffering to avoid the pain. And right. to avoid to see the unknown and uncertainty, because in our minds, we feel if we don't have control, then we're unsafe. Yet, if you surrender to your higher power, the oneness, the abyss, you'll see that, you know what? I wasn't meant to just live a life that is filled with pain. There is joy. Yet, what's happening with a lot, and myself included, which I always have to remind myself, is the suffering of the avoidance of whatever your experience is and not priming yourself to what are the tools to help me navigate through this, not avoid it. So to it's safety in your body. It's allowing yourself to have be allow your curiosity to go out there and see like, what control do I really have? And when I don't have the control, am I really that unsafe? Why is my body going so out of whack and dysregulated and out of fear trying to control everything? That's when the anxiety comes up and the, the busyness and the I can't sit still because it's it's trying to find control for safety. So it's having a dialogue with your, your biology, your nervous system. What is it that's here right now that I feel that I need safety from? And a lot of times you'll see it's the what ifs and the coulds and what is po like what bad things that are possible. You're not looking at the good things that could ha possibly happen. So what's coming to mind, something that I'm hearing, like the idea of self soothing, the asking you questions and the introspection. And one way I've done this, but I love writing when I'm feeling that mental chaos, which is creating stress and, and di um, you know, discomfort in my body, I go write it. I want to get it out of my head onto pen and paper to create clarity. And like a lot of times that alone, just getting it out of here, I'm pointing to my head, that alone creates some clarity and freedom. And because then I can see it on paper and be like, oh, it's really not that big of a deal. So what, yeah, what is a practice you do or what is something that you can offer listeners in this space? Take a moment to ask yourself what you're feeling. And, you know, we have an aversion to even recognize and acknowledge I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling afraid. Mm -hmm. Do you know how difficult it is for people just to say that? Yeah. yeah. And when you can be in... The confidence of, I don't know, that's your superpower. We're being told to always know everything. Yet, if you want to be in the unknown and uncertainty, it's, oh, I don't know. I don't know what the outcome can be. Yet, I do know that I have the capacity to navigate through it. I have the tools to be able to, you know, go through so for myself, it's journaling is one of them. Um, regulating my nervous system of asking myself, what am I feeling? What, what are these problems that are coming up that I can really look at? Like, that's why I say that radical honesty. I've, it took me years to have radical honesty and it still bucks. And sometimes I'm not there yet. When you can have radical honesty to reveal what your inner state, what's going on with the fear then you're able to go through it and calm it. Yet what people usually do is go all the way around. They don't know how to acknowledge because once you acknowledge your emotions and you validate them, there's a release. Yeah. Like anybody can say like, oh, I was, 
And then when I said like, I'm just feeling uptight and it's like, and it's like, oh, that's all it took. And I'm like, yeah, because we don't know how to validate our emotions. Just let them be seen. They're trying to get your attention and ramping up your system. And you don't know how to just say, I'm feeling this and not just, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Okay. What's the undercurrent? What's activating the anxiety? What's activating all these thoughts that are looping? And you go into the undercurrent so you better understand yourself. So you can understand your triggers. Because a trigger, once you understand your triggers, it's not that they're going to go away. That you can be aware that certain scenarios or situations are going to send me in a spiral in my head. That I got to use my tools to self-soothe, to regulate myself so that... I am not being hijacked by all of this fear and emotions. You know what the mindset shift I had when I feel those triggers, I think of it as a check engine light. I'm like, oh, oh. And I I become curious. I'm like, "Mm, what's coming up? What needs release? Again, this is so much self-awareness. We've touched on a lot today, but in the, you know, with the time that we have left, I would love to ask you, what do you believe is a key takeaway you want listeners to get? Remember to be kind to yourself. You matter. Yeah. And And kind, not in a passive way. Sometimes people think kindness is just getting your way all the time. And it's no being kind with, being firm with yourself and knowing what is it that you need. You know, it's coming to mind for me, the idea of when we do this um, uh, emotional release, what's available to us is the lighthearted, the play, the fun, the joy, and that's what we're here for. So like learn to regulate your nervous system because life does not have to be a struggle. No, it doesn't. I have a few rapid fire questions to ask you to wrap up the interview. Shoot. What is a quote or motto that you live by? Remember to be kind to yourself. What is in this space specifically, nervous system, this emotional regulation, what is a book you're currently reading or highly recommend? The Untethered Soul. Michael Singer. Why that one for this? Because it really gets you engaged with your nervous system to separate yourself from identifying with your nervous system and being in the moment in the unknown and the uncertainty and not being in the avatar, the persona that the nervous system has created these masks actually being yourself and then seeing, you know, the presentation of how other people will perceive you and recognize, Oh, okay. This is the game. We're in the game of life and how to play it. Final question. What advice would you give your younger self? I love you. Why that? I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel um, the value or that I had anything of value. Um, I felt othered because of the trauma that I experienced. It, it, othered me out of society out of humanness out of the space so the journey back into myself and within was the love and always seeking on the outside where it was like it was always here so really telling myself that that's a powerful message and a great note to end on nat nat thank you so much for joining me today thank you and Please remember to be kind to yourself, Heather, and thank you for the light that you're bringing to so many.